We're doing it. We're doing an invention. It's priority. Only way to, and the only way to do great work is to love what you do. Live life. Live life as though everything is though everything is rigged in your favor. Ignore the noise. Have faith in yourself. Have faith in yourself. Recognize that you are an entrepreneur. From the campus of the University of Maryland's Robert H. Smith School of Business, the Dingman Center for Entrepreneurship presents Bootstrap. Welcome to Bootstrapped, a Dingman Center podcast. I'm Ilana Fine. And I'm Joe Bailey. And as our loyal listeners know, each episode of Bootstrap features a funder and founder from the Dingman Center community. Uh, today, we are excited to welcome two of our Ladies First co-founders um, from Aurora Tights, Jasmine Sneed and Imani Rickerby. Welcome. Hi. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> <laughs> so I w- think we should start first. Let's, uh, let's start off. You want to give just like the, one, the one-liner the one on what Aurora Tights is, and then we can kind of rewind and hear a little bit more about the story behind it. Jasmine, you want to kick okay. us off? Yeah, Aurora Tights opens doors by providing ice skating and dance apparel for all skin tones and sizes. Okay, and so tell us a little bit about how you came you came up with this idea. Okay, oh. um, you want to get started? Yeah. Um, so Jasmine and I have known each other since freshman year um, of college at Maryland. We both skated on the Maryland team, and um, growing up when I was skating. I could not wear tights that fit my skin tone. And Jasmine could. Why? Because she dyed them like on her own, um, which is like very messy. Um, So we decided, we just over like conversation, we're like, hey, this is a great idea. We should be able to provide this for other people, especially that now that we coach, um, we have a lot of students of color that should be able to wear, you know, gear that fits their skin tone. Um, And over time, Aurora Tights has been created. And um, we also have a third um, team member, Sydney Park, who um, who's a dancer she used to dance at University of Maryland as well and uh, she brings the whole dance aspect so now um, right now we're starting off with tights with for both ice skaters and dancers can I ask I mean clearly this is a, a problem that you both experience from the consumer side of things did you look for solutions out there in the market initially well, yeah. So we also both did synchronized ice skating, and Imani, that's really her specialty. Um, I just did it a little bit later in life, but um, and we're forced to wear tights or that were a different shade, which was the usual option. Um, another option is like there was some color variety in dance, but it's usually very extreme, like a very darker shade. Um, so p- people have experimented with that, but with a dance tights, they're a little bit thinner than ice skating tights. Like mm-hmm. if you fall in a dance tight, you're completely wet. Mm-hmm. Versus when you fall in an ice skating tight, it's a little bit resistant. So they explored other options. However, what I ended up doing was dyeing tights myself because it kind of like elongates the body and so it's just a good option for people who ice skate and dance and so uh, so you guys you you find this connection with each other you talk about you know that you had been dyeing your tights and start thinking like oh we should solve this problem what did you do first <laughs> that's a good one um so we started dying tights on our own um so we're roommates well we were roommates um when we first started and we were experimenting with different types of dyes um and we still have different types of swatches of all these different kind of recipes that we were making um and yeah we started to realize that this is very hard and it's not consistent um so now we've looked at we're working with the manufacturer and now um our product is going to be consistent all all of the colors are going to look the same. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, like, so after we, like, talked about it, like we said, we were roommates. So you walked in the hall and started talking about it. We had all our business meetings in the hallway. And then, um, <laughs> Literally. <laughs> yeah. And then um, Sydney actually was working with the Dingman Center already for Imprology. And so she's like, you should go to Dingman Fridays. And I was like, oh, they're going to think this is silly. Like, I don't want to go there and tell them about ice skating. But we went, I had the complete opposite experience. And so we uh, I talked to a mentor that day. And then I also talked to Holly. And then she's the one who told me about Hatch. So then we just got started in the whole Dingman process. And so... Tell us a little bit about how, um, who else you talked to. So I remember, so we didn't think this idea was silly at all. I mean, actually, when it's one of those ideas that, you know, when you, you first came and started meeting with different people at the Dingman Center, you just thought to yourself, like, how is this possible? Like, how in, you know, 2017 or whenever it was that we first met, mm-hmm. is this is this the state of the state? Mm-hmm. And so I think that you your your ideas resonated with, with the Dingman Center immediately. 
But it just was all those things like, well, we, we think that should be a business, but how do we know, right? Mm-hmm. And so can you talk to us a little bit about how you went about talking to customers and getting like other validation that it wasn't just you, you two that had this problem? Yeah, so one of the amazing things we started doing was like the customer interviews, which was definitely encouraged by the Dingman Center because we started talking to the parents and then we started talking to the skaters, just starting originally with our, our local rinks. And then they're like, oh, you should talk to my friend here. You should talk to my friend there. So we just expanded to different ice rinks in the area. And then when we added dance, we started talking to different dance teams and people just was, wanted to talk to us. That was really interesting. It's like people were coming up with us and like trying to schedule interviews to talk. And that's when we kind of realized that it's not just women of color who have these issues. Like, nobody likes their tights. <laughs> nobody <laughs> likes them. So we kind of expanded our market, too. So, like, ideally, you want to do it for all women, so throughout the color spectrum. Mm-hmm. So um, at first, we were kind of limiting to just women of color. Just mm-hmm. all, I'm going to offer, like, two or three tights. But now we're going to expand to five shades. So what um, what did you learn also about you know what the the price point is on this like do is this a is this a premium product are you trying to make it so that it is you know, very 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 accessible Oh um, so yeah so our product right now we're selling it so it's it's in line with every all other tights on the market um, why we decided to do that um, we we want to make these tights easy accessible so no matter who you are you can you can be comfortable in your own skin and tell us then about your distribution strategy because I know um, you know you have figured out kind of the manufacturing piece. You you have all your your bulk orders. Mm-hmm. Now you want to go ahead and get in the hands of your customer. What's what's your mechanism? Yep. So we have right now our two major t- channels. The first is vending at different ice skating competitions. So um, right now the synchro season, especially the the season started, um, we plan to visit some competitions next um, in February and March, and then we also are going to sell online. And as you're focusing then on the metrics for success, what are the things you're focused on to say, wow, we've really made it here? Um, I think pro- pro- it would, my, my answer uh, would be selling our complete order like out, like with no hesitation. Um, you, I don't know. Well, actually, this is kind of definitely like the experimental round. That's yeah. because we have like the five different shades. So we're going to base off like how, which shades are the most popular, what footings are the most popular, because what we're going to do since we're doing ice skating and dance Ideally, for our second order, we'll have four different footings, mm-hmm. um, two for ice skating and two for dance. But right now, we're having one for ice skating, one for dance, the most popular one. So we're going to see what people want. And we're also going to do as well as um, we're going to feature the other options on our website and just see if they get any type of interest, just to see like what people might be wanting. Got it. So you're standing up actually versions of the product that doesn't yet get built, but you want to see if there's some interest yes. there. Yes. Do these things come in different? I'm sorry, I'm clueless in the product space here. <laughs> That's okay. Um, you you're doing, doing okay, Joe. You're doing okay. Oh, you're doing okay. Oh, We're okay. proud of you. You yeah. said double yeah. South Cal, so oh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. You're actually a star. That's right, yeah. <laughs> Do they come in different sizes? Yes. So that's actually something that's another slight issue with the industry for ice skating and dance because the sizes aren't relative to, like, usually adult women. Mm-hmm. Like, adult small. I was adult medium when I was, like, 12 and 100 yeah. pounds. So, like, oh, they're not, yeah. they don't. Well, that's great for the self I know. <laughs> <laughs> the I opposite know. of vanity yeah, sizing. exactly. Like, imagine being 13 year, years old and wearing, like, an extra large. No, that's, like, a, yeah, that's what? Terrible. Like, what do you mean? And, like, we're both, like, very petite, athletic right. build, right, you know? No, yeah. So it's very, it's very right. surprising. Yeah. yeah. So that's something that we're going to work with is like making it more actually relating to like the sizing of adult women and um, offering in different sizes. So like no matter who you are, you should be able to feel comfortable while you're skating. That's that's a tough decision to make because then you've got kind of a consumer perception about what the size should be and you've got to go ahead and put some type of label on their product. So how did you figure out the sizing component? Yeah, so there's actually, so for ice skating, it's not like this, but for dance, they have like a double size, like a small, medium, and a large, extra large. So I think that's a little bit more inclusive. So people who are accustomed to the usual ice skating or dance method, they know their sizing. Also for people who are just starting the sport, they'll have something too. Mm-hmm. And you described earlier, these products really don't cross over segments. It's not like somebody's buying their product for dance when it's actually being sold for ice skating. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, but again, I think from the business side of things, that's make things a little more complicated. Every time you have more sizes, you have mm-hmm. different segments, mm-hmm. different material, different shades. You said five shades. Yes. Those are stock keeping units. I worry that that unit economics may not work out. How do you, how do you figure that out? Well, yeah, that's kind of why we're starting off kind of more simply. You know, this is just we have our ideas of where we want to go with the company. However, we're going to start out with just with the two, the two different footings as well as the two different sizes, small, medium and large, extra large. Um, just to see where we're going with this, to mm-hmm. see where people want more and what, where people are like, no, that's not really something we're interested in. 
So you mentioned before we got started that you have secured a contract manufacturer, and we know from other guests that we've had on the show that that can be a very long process. Uh, and but yet that we we probably as as um, advisors to a lot of companies say, oh. You know, just go get a contract manufacturer. <laughs> okay, I'll go do that. I'll report back tomorrow. Uh -huh. And then you find it's a really hard process. Can you walk us through, first, what does that mean? And then mm -hmm. walk us through what you have gone through and how you ultimately decided on the manufacturer that you're going to be using. Yeah, um, it took forever. <laughs> Longer okay. than we expected. Takes um, forever. No. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so, funny, um, the, there's only five hosiery manufacturers in the United States, and I think four of them are in North Carolina. And um, none of them have websites. It was very, like, we had to... We were always looking online, um, found random random lists, and we would just email and call bunches of people, hoping we would get something back. Um, I think we started looking for actual manufacturing like June, and and we finally got we were able to uh, connect with two, and we uh, got down to one about a month ago. Um, so what was that? Six six long months. <laughs> yeah, and also uh, just to add to that, also when we started the search, we realized we were searching with the wrong words. So it was like the process of us learning. Learning as we go as well. Yeah. So just to just to um, double click into that a little bit, like so, what words were you using that were wrong, and what should you've been using? So we were using tights, okay. you know, because we're skating tights. But no, we were supposed to use we, we, we were supposed to use hosiery, or or sometimes they'll be under socks instead, um, because the same kind of machine that makes a sock it also makes um, a hose. <laughs> and the contract manufacturers you're meeting with are they educating you along the way, oh, teaching you? Yes. Um, Even the ones that you're not working with, they're happy to go ahead and walk you through that process. Mm -hmm, yes, um, especially the one that we're working with now, like Rodney. He's amazing. Like we're, we've been on the phone with him with for hours. He just explained everything. Um, no, he's been really. He, he always gives us a lot of information. And what kind of production run are we talking about for some of your initial markets? So, like, talking about how to actually make the tights? Well, I mean, I imagine at some point you and Rodney sit down and you're like, how many units do we want to produce for our first run to kind of see what's going on? Yeah, so that's a good thing. He's kind of flexible with us. He knows what stage we're in. So we're going to start off with like a smaller order. Um, the biggest hesitation actually isn't from his side of like creating the tights. It's the dyeing. So dyeing usually has really large batches, like goes by 100 dozens. So that's a lot to start off with one shade for us. So we're going to work on, it's, you have to pay a little bit more, but we're going to work on the smaller orders with him. Uh -huh. And so, how about the material? Where is that coming from? Yeah, he creates it. That's something that we actually had an issue with, too, because we thought we had to get in material, we're going to sew it. But no, so it's actually created kind of like a spider's web. Um, so you, they use the different yarn, and like a spider's web, and it creates it with no mm -hmm. seams in it at all. Yeah. Things that we just never even thought of. It's a very particular machine. Mm -hmm. Not everybody has them. So um, it's really great that we found Roddy to explain all yeah, that. Yeah, it's really cool. I want to see, like, the picture. Like, I can't even. So years ago, um, Holly Diarman is laughing in the in there. We went. Because uh, I don't know. So years ago, when we used to take the center trips to China, we, um... <laughs> We went to visit this sweater factory, and so pretty much that's what I'm a sweatery a sweatery factory in Shenzhen in China, mm -hmm. um, which is one of the most <laughs> massive and sweaty places I've ever been. Um, it was I don't know what like June fifth or something. It was very 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 hot. Anyway, and it was a very complex process of creating this you know, creating the sweaters and linking them, and there were thousands of people creating these sweaters it's a site i will never forget and that's basically what i'm <laughs> picturing right now so i might have to see a picture of these hosiery machines oh yeah they're yeah. humongous they're they're very big and they're kind of they're definitely expensive because they're so specialized but no it's very cool and like the process is like they use the yarn part of it is um nylon and part of it um it's like spandex, spandex so. material and they create it um and then they board it they stretch it out and then they dye it so it's like it's a long process of different steps but it's all a very small shop so this is not you know the big you know factories like in china this is definitely all sm small shop but clearly the thing that rodney and his team are doing you couldn't do by yourself no. these are not <laughs> things that you can go ahead and create one-offs for your customers yeah so definitely constructing it no we couldn't do that ourselves but like imani kind of mentioned before we did try the dyeing process ourselves so that that part is you could replicate as an individual, but it's much harder to do consistently on such a large scale. Mm -hmm. And so let me ask then, in terms of the product, is that the product something that you created jointly with Rodney, or is it something that you basically said, Rodney, build this, and he said, okay? 
no, we already had the vision by this point. So it's kind of like, we need this, this, and this. Are you able to do it? And he's like, yeah. yeah. And so we, he, we sent him the products that we wanted. We sent him the color swatches that we needed. Um, and he works with a dye house that's outside. And they dye it based on that color. They match it. They color match it. And, yeah, that's how we got it started. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, obviously, this, this um, process sounds complicated and multi-layered. And so, in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, expensive. And so, what's the uh, – I, I imagine on the – you know, initial inventory, you might not make as much on the <laughs> as as later as later um, as later sales. But can you talk to me what you think the unit economics are going to be, and what you think the margins will eventually be on the on the tights? Yeah. So right now it's around four dollars to construct it and actually package it. So which is pretty, it was a lot less expensive than what we were starting with because at first we were planning on wholesaling, dyeing them ourselves, and sending it out, which wasn't as feasible because. Wholesale price is like $8 a tight. So we got it down to $4, which includes packaging. Um, and then we're going to be selling the dance tights for roughly around $16, $15.99, which is premium in the market. And starting out just for our original ice skating tight, we're going to start off with $21.99. Mm-hmm. But um, ice skating tights can increase. It can go over $30. However, there's a little bit more specialized, have a little bit more detail, which is kind of like our next step. And so on the in, a, in the life of an ice skater and every year, how many are they buying a year? Is it one pair, five pairs, ten pairs? How often do they go through it? How much in your experience? Um, it depends. So me personally, I would probably buy five tights a year. But okay. um, I definitely have teammates that right now they get ten tights um, for like a couple every couple months. So there's it's a large spectrum, especially with kids. I mean, they fall. They rip, yeah. and then there goes another pair of tights, you know? And, and did, did you ever consider selling this wholesale? We had a previous guest that actually talked to selling athletic departments and stuff. Have you considered selling to, let's say, the University of Maryland ice skating team or club? Yes. Thank you for mentioning. That's <laughs> my, <laughs> my pleasure. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's actually our South other Cal. sales. Yeah. <laughs> Double South Cal. Thank Double you very South much. Cal, absolutely. But yeah, that's actually one of our sales streams, like have team accounts. Mm-hmm. And so one of our mentors, Jason from SCX, he's the one who – pretty introduced this to us because we were really didn't even have an idea but like establishing the relationships with those teams uh the hardest part is just making meeting their schedules because they buy it usually before the season Uh starts and the one like you know great thing that we have is imani is the coach for the (laughs) um university of maryland synchro team so we have the connection there (laughs) but we need to expand out to other teams as well and so you you just um gave me a, a softball here so let's transition into your team so you you introduced in the in the upfront. You talked about how you both were uh, were skaters, different kinds of skaters, mm-hmm. which <laughs> uh, uh, and that ja- um, that Sydney was also um, was a dancer. Mm-hmm. So you obviously had that background. But talk to me a little bit about, more about the dynamics of the team and what you e- all, each are bringing to the table. Cool. Yeah. Um, so we're a special bunch, actually. Um, we're also line sisters. Um, so we're line sisters. We were roommates. Um, uh, what we each bring, well, I'll just speak about myself. Um, I'm the more like, I'm very type A. I have the planner that is highlighted. Sorry. I have the planner that is highlighted. Um, I'm the one that takes Jasmine and Sydney's great, grand ideas. And I'm like, okay, this is actually what we're going <laughs> to do. Or this is what is actually feasible with this time frame. Um, I think because we're so close, like at the end of the day, we are sisters. We are best friends that, um, yes, there are little like tension but it's never it's for the better of the team you know and like I don't take someone else's critique or opinion against mine like it's more of like okay we have a goal with Aurora let's do whatever to make sure that it it excels yeah, no, like definitely, exactly. And I'm gonna explain line sisters just in case oh, anybody yeah. doesn't know. <laughs> yeah, line sisters. I was gonna ask. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's like a sorority sister. Okay. So yeah, um, we became oh, sorority. Oh, li- you're you're yeah. big brother or sister? Yeah, big sisters. And you're in the like line. We're the same. Oh, yeah, so we, the yeah, same, same line. Okay, Big sixteen. Mm-hmm. Got it. Sixteen. Yeah. So um, in Sydney as well. So we were all doing this together. So we just have uh, our networks definitely tie in different ways. Um, and so like um, like Imani was explaining like. Me and Sydney have plans 15 years down the road, you know. Sometimes it's hard for us to, like, stay in the moment. And then that's something that Imani's good at is, like, kind of doing the more practical side where we're kind of thinking, okay, what can we do next and moving forward? Yeah, that's a really um, interesting way. Sorry, I've just interrupted Joe. But uh, it's a really interesting way to 
uh, describe a team, and we we talk to you know, founders all the time, and somebody else. So well, I handle the business. I'm more of the technical person, but I actually really lo- love how you describe kind of from a skill set and kind of like a how you kind of tackle the world and thinking about big vision versus execution. Because I think in a startup, you kind of you have to have both. Like if you don't have the big vision, you know, you won't you won't ever really launch. You'll think, oh, it's not big enough. You know, we'll never get there. But if you don't have the the tactical execution, like what are we doing today? <laughs> then you'll always just be sketching things out and never actually starting the business. So I, I like how you, you describe it that way. Anyway, I, I was just thinking about our listeners right now who are hearing from Jasmine and Amani, and some of them at home might be thinking, I don't know which one of the two is speaking. <laughs> I know, you really are. <laughs> I have the higher voice. Yeah. Too much. <laughs> yeah. I mean, again, we have the studio, and we're, we're, we're happy to have you here, and I get to go ahead and know who's speaking by looking at you. But I do think you know the fact that you describe yourself as so different bringing those different skills and talents. And you said Sydney is the third member of the team? Mm-hmm. Yes. I, I got to ask, what is it like to have kind of co-founders, all women? I guess because we don't have anything different to compare to. I think we all were started in college, so it's not like we've had a lot of even work experience with like more male environment. This is exactly what we created it as. Mm-hmm. So I guess we don't have enough experience, as I don't, to compare it to a different type of well, environment. Let me ask you this then, because you know one of the things that we've been trying to highlight here in Bootstrapped is the idea that we want to celebrate female entrepreneurship. And I've got to imagine as you're telling your story and looking to great partners, Rodney is male, I presume? Yes. Right? So what is it like kind of being entrepreneurs out there kind of pitching your idea to men? Oh, yeah. Though that definitely can be like an experience. Like, what are you talking about? Yeah. And so we kind of learned, kind of working for our mentors, like, which is why we just did the Pitch Dingman competition, um, pitch competition like two weeks ago, I believe. Yeah. Congratulations uh, on making the finals. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. And uh, one thing we just realized, we have to wear them. We have to show people Ooh. what we're talking about because with women, it's like, okay, I get you. Even if I'm not in a sport, I can kind of understand. We wear stockings, we wear hoses. So it's like, but with guys, it really is easier just like, I have to show you what I'm talking about. Exactly. Yeah. So, so did you wear the tights for the competition? Oh yeah, yeah. with our skates Well too. done. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I'll have to go back and look at the pictures. That's great. <laughs> That was that's good advice, and it did, and it worked well. You obviously made the finals, mm-hmm. but did you feel like you that connection came uh, better? Did one of you wear different tights to yeah. show the difference? Yeah. That's exactly yeah, that's literally what we did. Oh, maybe I can get a job there. <laughs> 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 nice, fair. Yeah, it, that's a you know, it's a uh, it is a really great point. I mean, and sometimes, particularly with you know, when you're pitching your business, we see it with entrepreneurs all the time. Like, just show. Show like what is the product? We don't we don't understand it. And I know that in um, in class last year, I remember when you brought in the tights. I think to like at the MVP portion mm-hmm. of the class, yeah. like oh, that, okay, I get it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm sure to like to show the difference is probably even more impactful. All right. So again, as the guy here in the studio and thinking about all the things that you need to do to get this right, you've got the operations, you've got the unit economics, you've got the product customer fit and stuff like that. What's the big vision here? What happens next? You, you get traction in the marketplace, things start to grow. What's the vision? Well, that's you know, well I guess you start have first. Jasmine answer that since yeah. you said that you're the visionary. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely my favorite yeah. part. Yeah. <laughs> that's definitely my favorite part. And I guess we kind of want to expand a lot of different ways. So we want to go to other performance sports. We see us more so just like not just for ice skating and dance, but like there's like a whole lot of niche community for like cheerleading, gymnastics, and different types of dance as well. So it's like we kind of just want to expand and more so in those different spaces. Um, as well as like we just want to like kind of create our own like a uh, community. So we're going to start like a – a network through first through like a group me just like starting with girls at different ice rinks just to kind of create that network and kind of expand and eventually one day we want to have our own competitions we have want to have our own type of like not clubs but able to like to set up at a competition like our own little a space mm-hmm. there so we kind of like expand like just growing through that way yeah and then like 10 years from now maybe what we really hope is to be a place like a one-stop shop for everything so if i'm a dancer a cheerleader ice skater i could get my tights from aurora i could get my bag my my ice skating guards anything um so that's like the really big big dream that we hope to get we love it and this you guys it reminds me i mean this kind of the theme of inclusiveness inclusiveness in sports i think i've probably uh, i had mentioned this start this um entrepreneur to jasmine maybe a couple years ago but her name, I think her first name was Yasmin, but I think, but she was trying to create um, essentially a sports apparel for Muslim girls. Uh, and the issue was that they would, uh, they would have to buy because they needed to cover you know more of their mm-hmm. body than most uh, sports apparel would buy these huge extra large sizes, which obviously then they couldn't perform in. So um, 
uh, I don't know if she ended up um, coming forward with that business, but I think your I get your vision of like there's of a more inclusiveness in sports that you know the peril is clearly for a very you know narrow group of of athletes and there's mm-hmm. a ton of opportunity. Um, I want to point out one I have one one thing I want to point out on this because I I just love you know I, I you guys know that I, I love your story but one of the great things just to um, to dovetail on what Joe said about you know focusing more on women and entrepreneurship one of the places that I've used the example of your story is that when you bring in more people into entrepreneurship whether it's you know you know women or any other underrepresented um, entrepreneur you have a whole a velocity of new ideas mm-hmm. like this isn't something that you know it, that you just that quite honestly like Joe probably wouldn't have thought of this idea and I wouldn't have thought of this idea so I just thought it's just a perfect example of like why we need to continue to encourage and you know the inclusive you're you're focusing on inclusive on inclusion but you know why in the world of entrepreneurship we have to because there's a whole other set of ideas that we are unlocking in that way no, I mean, yeah. I think, you know, so the I agree completely with that and the idea that, you know, as entrepreneurs, I think you saw something that other people wouldn't see. And it doesn't matter how much, let's say, empathy or customer interviews I would do. There's a kind of a cultural component there. There's a connection that you have to your customers that's fantastic and should be celebrated. Will that same kind of culture and connection allow you to kind of reach that vision? Do you see that kind of customer discovery process playing out as you see that big goal? So as far as like our customers, like creating a like long term relationship with our customers, yeah, one of the great things like my mentor and I talked about this almost immediately was the fact that like we have a innate like a natural community, you know, that no matter where you go, we're going to have this community. It's just expanding upon that, and that's kind of why like our big goal is to bring people together, um, because there's women of color in ice skating rinks, but a lot of times like for Imani, she might have been the only black girl on the team. I was, yeah, <laughs> and, but for me, like I grew up in a very diverse ice skating rink in a very diverse like just performance community so it wasn't the same case but just bringing people together so they don't feel so alone like Mm -hmm. those competitions are huge so if you're the only black girl on your team like you're gonna feel like you don't not a lot of people to talk to um but like if you have that network there like you already know those people like they can like approach each other at competitions and things like that and I think that probably goes into, oh, I think, I know you guys have also a bigger, you know, a vision of like, okay, what are we doing then to get more so that, you know, the Amani from 15, in 15 years from now isn't the only black girl at the competition. Exactly. That there's lots because they feel like it's a, a sport that is being inclusive. Mm-hmm. Um, before, I have one question before we wrap, since it's bootstrapped, um, it's, uh, you know, it's incumbent on me to ask about how you're planning on financing the company. So what is it taking to get this up and running and where do you see, how do you see funding the company going forward yeah so starting out we definitely started just with like our own funds getting very just getting started of course then we started getting more like funding from dingman which has definitely like, propelled us forward um and even just recently we got more funding because of the pitch dingman competition um but outside of that we are going to start crowdfunding which is like, a beast yeah. within itself that we're learning as we go mm-hmm. um as well as applying to other accelerator programs and things like that yeah crowdfunding is a great great fit for this kind of you know consumer product um, well, Jasmine, Imani, thank you so much for being in studio with us today and really good luck with this company. Yes, we thank look you forward very to watching much. It. Yes. And congratulations on your success so far. We wish you all the best. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. It's a perfect example. The Aurora Tight story really is a perfect example of one, a company that maybe 10 years ago, um, not because of you know, any reason other than just time that might have walked into the Dingman Center, or any other entrepreneurship center, someone might have said like, I don't get it. Like, why? You know, that's not that's not a market. And I think um, one because of the inclusive nature of our center, the way that we've embraced social entrepreneurs, we've embraced women entrepreneurs. One immediately, um, they were embraced. But two, we gave them the skill set to say, like, I, even if you don't think this is a market, we actually are gonna. Even, even though they, no one really doubted it, but we gave them the skill set to say, like, I'm gonna prove. I, I'm gonna create a minimal viable product. I know it's. I know it's not going to be perfect. I'm going to go talk to customers. I'm going to go talk to um, the, uh, I know Jasmine talked to all the organiza- organizing bodies around figure skating. I'm going to go and talk to all these people. I'm going to have the confidence to go talk to a contract manufacturer and understand that I need to know you know these 10 things. So um, it is it is really rewarding to hear them talk about it, but also because um, not just as, oh, this is a great not that this is a great story and it's a great business idea, but that it's very clear that they were given the right set of tools to be able to move it forward. So. Wonderful story. 
I'm glad they shared it with us. And yes. thank you for, for, for all that you did to help them on their journey. Um, so that wraps up our uh, forty. What do we say? Our forty ninth episode of Bootstrapped, um, a Dingman Center podcast. I'm Ilana Fine. You can follow me at, at Ilana Fine or the Dingman Center at UMD underscore Dingman. And I'm Joe Bailey. I'm going to suggest you follow Ilana Fine. She's one fantastic <laughs> individual and a great collaborator in so many things. And and for Bootstrapped, which really started from Oscar's vision and. Holly's, you know, vision as well as an associate producer and the collaboration with you, Alana, has been fantastic. And to all of our loyal listeners, thank you very much. Uh, keep continuing to subscribe and download our episodes. And if you're out there doing amazing things, keep bootstrapping your next venture. Bootstrapped would like to thank its cast. Bootstrapped hosts, Ilana Fine and Joe Bailey. Bootstrapped executive producer, Oscar Santana. And associate director of the Dingman Center, Holly Diarmid. Remember to subscribe to our show on iTunes and leave a five-star review.